Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Liz Rutledge, Director of Wildlife Resources at the Wildlife Federation. Thank you for attending tonight's webinar, which is part of the 15 webinar series, Learn to Deer Hunt. This series offers a dynamic lineup of presentations and materials curated by the New Hill Hunter Education and Mentoring Program, covering a wide variety of topics to guide new deer hunters from pre-season scouting to processing. The series is hosted and moderated by the North Carolina Wildlife Federation in conjunction with its South Wake Conservationist chapter. A couple minutes to provide some background on Wildlife Federation programming related to R3, which is retention, recruitment, and reactivation. So first of all, the Wildlife Federation has partnered with NC State, Wildlife Resources Commission, Wake County Wildlife Club, and other conservation groups for Academics of Field, which is a program to build upon current R3 programming, introducing college students from non-traditional backgrounds to hunting and shooting sports. We also participate in Getting Started Outdoors, which is a partnership between the Wildlife Federation and the Wildlife Resources Commission, and we provide an all-day educational workshop and one-on-one -on -one deer hunting mentoring opportunity for all the participants. So that may be something that's of interest to you all. For those interested in wildlife and conservation policy issues, the Wildlife Federation has what we call the CAMO Coalition, which is a listserv to keep members up to date on policies specifically geared toward hunters and anglers. And you can find a page on our website for Camo Coalition if you're interested in signing up for that. Um, Artemis is a program of the National Wildlife Federation that the North Carolina Wildlife Federation promotes to uplift women in sporting and conservation to provide small group hunting and mentoring opportunities for females. Um, the Wildlife Federation is proud to host this webinar series in conjunction with the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program and additional partners who contribute the educational content for the webinars that we're able to bring to you all. In addition, Wildlife Federation volunteers Guy and Judy Gardner partner with the Wildlife Resources Commission to provide skills-based seminars consisting of Deer Hunting 101 and From Field to Freezer Deer Processing. These usually occur in September. They're open to the public, and these may be of interest to you all as well. The Wildlife Federation also works directly with North Carolina Hunters for the Hungry to facilitate the donation of hunter harvested deer to feed the hungry across the state. So that's another avenue where you can take your skills that you learn in this program and uh, help feed the hungry. All right, the seminar series was curated by the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program and the facilitating partners listed on the slide. The webinars are for adults new to deer hunting and includes practical topics to explore the ins and outs of hunting and enhance your overall outdoor experience. Please see the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program Facebook page for more information on field opportunities. And I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker tonight, which is Guy Gardner from the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program. I'll provide a little background on our speaker and then I'll let him introduce the webinar topic for this evening. Guy Gardner has been an active wildlife educator in North Carolina for the past 15 years, serving as a volunteer for the Wildlife Resources Commission, the National Deer Association, and the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. Since receiving the North Carolina Governor's Award for Wildlife Conservationist of the Year with his wife, Judy, in 2009, the two have been actively involved in development of the Wildlife Federation's deer donation program. They have organized both deer camps and a first of its kind new hunter mentoring initiative, the New Hill Hunter Education and Mentoring Program. And they deliver both deer hunting seminars and hunter education classes on behalf of the Wildlife Resources Commission. Several STEM-inspired programs promoting youth connection with the outdoors have been developed by this team. Guy and Judy are active members of the South Wake Conservationist chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, hosting a deer donation site for North Carolina Hunters for the Hungry on behalf of this chapter, which is involved in taking aim against hunger for their community. So uh, as you can see and hear, Guy and Judy are extremely involved in all of our hunting and education programming. So we're extremely excited to have Guy here tonight to talk to you about 
um, cameras. So there you go, Guy, I'll turn it over to you. So we'll get started on this. I do wanna thank you all for taking the time to come and, and listen to this um, webinar on uh, cameras um, you use in the field. They're called trail game or wildlife cameras, depending on um, who you are, they, different names for the same thing, basically. So we are, this is a, a, in a series of, of seminar, webinars that uh, Liz had talked to you about. So this one is a little bit specialized. Trail cameras are used pretty widely by hunters, but the good thing about these is they can be used by others as well. Any a wildlife watcher, or uh, we'll talk a little bit about surveillance, uh, things like that. There are a lot of out tra trail cameras out there. You can see by this picture here, this is just a some store. You go to Cabela's or Bass Pro and you can have a huge selection. Uh, it gets a little confusing sometimes as to what to, what to purchase. So you'll just have to decide how you're gonna use this camera and then do your research. There's a lot of good information online to help you make that selection. There are two references that I use. One of them is a book. It's a little bit older, but they created this book. Uh, it used to be the Quality Deer Man Association. Now it's the National Deer Association. And this book is titled Deer Cameras, The Science of Scouting. Um, they have purposely made it so it doesn't date itself quite so bad, uh, but there is some information that's changed now with, as technology. I think it's about a 10 year old book. Another one that I like to use, it's a website, is called trailcampro.com. It is a site that sells cameras, but they do a lot of testing and they'll analyze these different cameras for various aspects of its functionality. It's a great place to go and when you're looking at a specific camera, hopefully they've done some tests on it and um, you can see the, the outcome from them. And these are some of the tests, when you look at those tests, these are some of the tests you might want to do after you purchase a camera yourself. So what are we going to cover tonight? Um, why are you going to, why do you want to use trail cameras? There's various reasons for it. Uh, one of the big ones for most, if you're a hunter, is scouting. Uh, it's a great tool. Um, we're going to talk about purchase considerations, and that includes what's inside your camera, and then how do you use it, how do you set it up, things to watch out for. And it's used for not just for deer hunting or for hunting, but it can be used for other wildlife. And there is a system in that book that I mentioned does have a whole chapter on how to do deer surveys. So if you own your own land or you have a hunt club and you want to know what the deer population is like on your, on your property, this is a great way to do it. It's a lot of fun. We did it on Harris Lake Park um, one to, a few years ago and just had a great time. And then last, just a very brief uh, overview of the Candid Critter Project. And this was by NC State University. We'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, so why do you want to use trail cameras? Well, the big advantage to them is they're usable 24 seven and all year round. So instead of you having to walk around hiking and tromping around the ground, um, spooking things, you can set these cameras up and it's taking photographs 24-7. Um, so it's a good way to find out what's going on. Obviously, a lot of animals are nocturnal and these things still take pictures at night. So it's a great way to find out what's going on. With the camera survey, you can check your deer densities, your buck doe ratios, various aspects of your deer population. You can find out where, how are the deer moving? You know, what are their moving patterns? I'll show you in a few minutes. It's not quite so easy to pattern these deer because their home range is fairly extensive. And so trying to make a, to do a pattern of a, of a deer is not so easy. But you can also identify predators. I had somebody that set up their first trail camera on some property they'd owned their whole life, their family property. And all of a sudden they were getting pictures of bobcats and coyotes that they never knew were there. So it gives you some information that you may not be aware of. Who else is there? This is where the surveillance comes in. You can set your camera up mainly to take wildlife pictures, but next thing you know, you're getting pictures of somebody in a four-wheeler driving by or um, somebody out there even poaching or doing different things. So it can be used for surveillance as well. The good thing about it is you're not out there moving around and, and tromping on the ground, leaving your scent and your activity, which can impact deer movement and uh, 
deer availability or, or any wildlife actually. But one of the things that came up when I was doing the research on this, is this an unfair advantage? And so we'll talk a little bit about that. It's there, it, there is some restrictions in certain states, but not in North Carolina. And the whole thing is your intent. If your intent is to figure out exactly where and when you are gonna hunt because you know that deer is gonna be there based on camera set, your camera sets, then this becomes um, a question of fair chase. And this is where this um, restrictions on this is, is been put into place because you want the, um, the animal to have all the opportunity to escape. And so by using this advanced technology, you may be infringing on, on the fair chase. And this really goes on when we talk a little bit more about the wireless cameras these wireless transmissions. And these are actually live. And so you could know exactly where that deer is at that moment. So it gets a little bit um, dicey when it comes to that. And that's true of most technologies, where technology is advancing, especially in electronics so fast that um, there's all kinds of opportunities to kind of infringe on this fair chase. And then the, this about reducing the pleasure I have had known, known people that have images of a, usually it's a buck, if you're not into big antlers or anything, but a lot of people are. And they'll get a picture of a really large deer, a really beautiful deer on there. And this becomes their focus for the whole season. Well, these deer sometimes, and we'll talk about this again when I talk about the ranges, these deer have pretty wide ranges and this deer may come one time and you get it on your camera, it may never come back by there again. And you spend your whole season not even thinking about any other deer but this one, and it can make an impact on the on your pleasure for at least that one season. So which one are you gonna purchase? And again, you have to do your research, but there are just so many cameras out there. The two major varieties are the memory card, some kind of a storage system, and then your wireless transmission, which we'll talk about both. So you just gotta do your research, get on there. You get what you pay for. You can get some low cost cameras that can do adequate work, but whether they'll last, you know, that's another question. But if you're willing to spend the money, um, you get better resolution on your, on your images if that's what you need. So their price range, I've seen them in even under $50 and then over several hundred dollars. So you just have to look and decide which which way you want to go. But the three main factors that you'll want to consider is one, trigger speed. And this is the time that it takes from the, the minute your passive infrared detector picks up mo motion to the time it captures the image. So trigger speeds are, very, are variable. The less expensive cameras tend to have greater trigger speed, which is, can be two, two minutes and more the better ones have a half second or less. I mean, I'm not minutes, I'm one to two seconds or, or more, or the better ones a half second or less. And so it depends on how you're gonna use it. We'll talk about these. If you're gonna set on a food source where the deer hangs around for a while, slower trigger speeds aren't that important. Um, but if you're gonna be on a trail where deer may be walking or maybe even running, a quick trigger speed is very important. And that goes with their t detection zone. This is the area in which the camera can detect motion. It's how large the area is. It's generally a cone shape from the, the lens of the camera from the, uh, or the, the uh, passive infrared sensor outward and it's in a cone shape. So these can be narrow or it can be very wide. And you'll wanna test that when you, after you buy your camera, but again, the research can help determine which, which you have. The last one they're gonna talk about now is recovery rate. And this is how quickly a camera can recover and after an image is taken. So how quickly can it rearm itself to take the second picture? Again, this is very important depending on how you're using your camera. You can actually miss pictures of if there's a line of deer or a line of animals or something like that. It can take a picture of the first one but then it may miss the second or third one because it's rearming itself, getting ready to take.
So again, I've mentioned this before, how are you going to use your camera? Uh, this is very important on what your what the modes and, and what you're going to need in, a, in your trail camera. If you're going to use it over bait, minerals, other food sources, again, like I can mention the animal is just standing there for long periods of time. You, you don't need the quick trigger speed. You don't need the quick recovery rate necessarily. If you're going to monitor deer trails, you do because the deer, like I said, they can be walking or even running fast. So you're going to need a quick trigger speed and quick recovery. If you're going to use it for scouting only or deer surveys, you know, that may determine what type of camera you want. Uh, the deer surveys, you can get hundreds, sometimes even thousands of images. So you're going to need one that has long battery life and uh, a great storage capacity. Security, you can use these for security. You can use them out on your property. You can use them around your house. So you may want to consider, we'll talk about the different types of flashes, and you'll probably want one maybe with a, a no-glow flash so that somebody who's trespassing won't see the, uh, the flash. So how techy are you? If, if you're good with these kind of things, um, ease of setup is something important to look at when you're looking at these reviews. Some of them are a little bit more difficult. Some of them are very, very simple. How often will you visit? You're going to need, if you're not going to go out very often, we'll talk more about this too, about, you know, spooking the animals. You don't want to scare the animal, your target animal, whether it's deer or other, other animals. So the less you can go out there, the better. So you're going to need long battery life and, and large photo storage if you don't want to go out there so often. And the last here is megapixel rating. And this is a big sailing uh, point to most uh, manufacturers and it's not really that important in most cases uh, like it says a three to five megapixel is usually fine for most standard uses if you're looking to take high quality digital images that you may want to use to blow up and use for art or something you may want to look at something significantly different um, but they, they are, there's a lot of information on this on the, the way they rate their uh, the megapixels of a camera. A lot of them overrate it because they have software built in that actually interpolates the, the image. So the, the raw megapixel is lower than what they advertise. So if you want to more, learn more about that, it is online. I've, I read up on that and it gets a little confusing, but um, just remember you, you, for, for the average home use or hunting use or just wildlife observation, uh, three to five megapixels is really all you need. The, the more image, the more megapixels you have, the uh, it actually takes more memory as well. So you may not want the high, highly rated one so that you can save on memory and storage. So here's basically what m most cameras have. Um, you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor there. These right here are the infrared LEDs and this is what causes the flash. Um, we'll talk about flashes in a minute. Here's your camera lens. I'll talk about those as well. There's not as much talked about when you look at the marketing. They don't talk too much about the lens quality, which they should, but they don't. This is your passive infrared sensor. And this is actually a lens over top of it. The sensor is actually inside. It's called a Fres Fresnel lens. And it's what focuses the infrared heat um, that comes from your target animal. You'll have some kind of an on-off switch. Then you'll have a battery tray. I'll show you how many batteries. A lot of them take a, quite a few batteries. And then you have your menu, menu, con menu control. This is where you're going to set your modes for your camera. This little LCD display, this smaller one like this, is really only to set your camera. They're, they do make some, which you'll see in a, in a minute, that has a, a larger screen that you can actually view some of the uh, images that your camera has taken. So those, it just depends on the camera. And again, these, when you're setting up your camera, they will display the different modes as you scroll through them and you select the modes that you're gonna use for that, uh, for that specific camera. So I mentioned the passive infrared uh, detector. This is actually the sensor uh, that detects motion and temperature differences. So <clears throat> they call it heat in motion. So this doesn't actually send out a, a infrared beam or anything. They do have cameras that have that, but these are not. These are actually sensors that pick up the difference in heat 
um, as an animal walks by. So um, as the temperature, the ambient temperatures outside increase, we get some hot, humid days like we have today and even hotter, you, you get less reliability on these cameras because the body temperature of the animal is almost equal to the outside ambient temperature. So the, a lot of these sensors won't pick that up. Um, some cameras do have sensitivity controls. And if it does have that, when the temperature is real high, you may want to increase the sensitivity. And when it gets cold, you can lower the sensitivity. But um, these are the kind of the guts of the whole thing. It allows it to pick up the, uh, the motion and actually take the image. Like I mentioned, the lens, some of them are plastic, some of them are glass. It just depends on, on the quality. They just don't talk about this. Really, the only way to determine the um, quality of the lens is you have to see what the pictures look like, the images after they've been taken. So this is where some of the reviews, you can go on to reviews um, and you can see actual images. Some of the uh, people that have purchased it will actually show the images that they have taken with that camera. And you can see the quality if this is something that uh, you'd like to, ha like to have. And then you got storage. Most of the cameras now will take up to a 32 gigabyte SD card, and that will store over 10,000 images. So what they say is approximately 350 pictures per gigabyte on still pictures. Now, if you do video, which most cameras do have the capability of video, um, you can only take about 30 30 second videos on a 32 gigabyte card. So you can see videos, if that's what your choice is, you'll get far less videos than you will still images. There is a compact flash. A lot of you may know far more about this than I do. It's generally on more expensive cameras, but the advantage, it can write faster to the storage. And so it's, it, re, it allows your camera to rearm a little bit quicker. And you can see on this picture at the bottom, that takes a lot of batteries. You know, most of them take you know, somewhere around eight AA batteries. So you can go through a lot of batteries. Um, generally, the lithium ion are, are better. They last a lot longer. But again, just like with your um, SD card, your batteries, you have to read your manual because they'll dictate what you can and cannot use as far as storage and batteries. And then on this camera, you can see that uh, display. The one in the middle shows the smaller display that's used really for your uh, setting up your camera. But then on this bottom one, it has a larger one where you can actually view images from your camera. It can be very handy, especially when you're setting up. And we'll talk about setting up in, in a few minutes. Like I mentioned, there are three basic flash types. The first one, which you don't find too much anymore, is the white flash. It's a standard flash that you get on your most uh, personal cameras. Um, it is a bright flash of light. Um, it can scare games. Some people swear that uh, animals become, will avoid the area because of this flash. And it kind of makes some sense as it is very bright. And, uh, you know, especially deer, a lot of these nocturnal animals be very sensitive to a bright light like that. Uh, the good, big advantage to this is the, the nighttime pictures will be in color, like that top picture. So this can be a real advantage um, for, for your photography to get color. So this is something you don't see anymore. When they, these trail cameras first came out, white flash was all you could get. There was rumors, and I, I think I, I believe it's probably true, where pe people would go out into hunt areas and wait to see a flash they'd march over there and steal cameras. So this is makes it easy to find those cameras as long as there's something taken, you know, it's taken pictures and it's given that big white flash. So the, the next one is a red glow or low glow. These are infrared emitters. And that's what you saw on that one camera, uh, their LED infrared. This The low glow do produce a slight red glow, but it's not alarming generally to deer. Um, it, the night pictures will be in black and white. You can't get color with these infrareds. But so this one does have a little bit better quality than the third one that we're going to talk about. So um, this is kind of a middle of the road one. The last one is black or no glow. This one actually gives no light whatsoever. Um, 
Again, it's colors, it, the images at night will be in black and white. It gives a little less quality, I think, than the, uh, than the low glow, but uh, most people can live with it if they feel they need that absolutely no, no flash light whatsoever. And these, when you talk about surveillance cameras, these might be some of your best choices because people can't see anything. They can't see the glow to, to find, find your camera. So those are your um, storage, you want to have some kind of a storage mechanism. The other one you can get are the wireless trail cameras. Wireless transmission. And these are actually kind of fun in some ways. We used one for a while at our hunt club. But they basically have the same capabilities as a traditional trail camera. But it can send images to your cell phone or your uh, laptop. And um, so these do require some kind of a data plan. So you, it depends on the camera you're using. Um, so it, the ones we had was made by SpyPoint and you had to install the app. And so you paid a certain amount for that. So you have to have cell service. And so, you know, some of these areas are so isolated where you're going to be hunting or where you're going to look at some of this wildlife that sometimes cell service is an issue. Now, some of the stuff I read said they do have boosters and all kinds of stuff, but it gets into the, the cost, gets pretty high when you start doing all that. But it, it might be worth a try. Um, we liked ours. We did it. It, it had um, some problems in that the service would come and go and so on some of them. Some of them, it stayed pretty consistent. But it did take pretty good pictures, um, so we, we enjoyed them. But they, after a while, quit working, and so we gave up. But um, anyway, it might be worth a try. The one advantage to this, obviously, you're not having to go and take out SD cards um, and things like that. So you still have to keep the batteries up. So you may not have to go there quite as often, and you, you get to see what's going on. And this is, again, when you talk about fair chase because you could actually have these set up in different areas around your deer stand if you're hunting and have them sending p images to you and, and you could actually see if a deer's coming your way, which, you know, kind of infringes a little bit on that. So it's a personal choice. Highly recommend some kind of a kit, a gear bag or a kit, because when you go out to either initially set up or go to check your cameras, you don't want to get out there and walk all the way and you've already disturbed the area some and then find out, oh, I forgot SD cards or I forgot batteries or I forgot this. So if you set up this gear kit and have it all stocked and ready, make and check it twice before you head out and either set up cameras initially or when you're going out to refresh cameras. So these are just some of the things you want. If you're going out there initially, of course, you want your cameras, um, all of them with fresh batteries. Highly recommend you preset your modes so that you're not out there um, disturbing everything longer by having to set the, the, the triggers, the um, number of pictures, the, the delay and all this, you have to set up all these. So try to do this in advance. And I can tell you out in the bright sun, those little displays can be very hard to see. So you have to get them in the shade and shadows in order to see them in order to set your mode. So much easier to do this at home before you go out. Take extra cords, um, straps, and security cable if you need it. If you do have a security cable, which I'll show you one, which has some kind of a locking system on it to keep it from walking away, make sure you bring your keys. If you want to move these things and you don't have your keys, it's not going to go anywhere. So uh, make sure you have your keys with you. Always bring some kind of a cutting implement, folding saw, uh, little pruning shears. This way you can move and remove um, Obst obstructions or obstacles that are in the way of your, your camera. If it's your initial one, you want it some kind of a map. You want to map out where you're placing these cameras. If you decide you're going to set out quite a few, you want to be able to find them again. So uh, either use your phone. If you've got um, some kind of a, a mapping system on your phone, you can uh, log where you the, the uh, uh, coordinates for these or you put it on a paper map, however you want to do it. But some kind of an area to spread out your cameras. I like to bring an SD card reader if your, phone, if your camera doesn't have one of those screens, especially when you're initially setting it up because you don't wanna set this up, walk away, come back in a month, 
and find out your camera wasn't set up right and your pictures are taken too high or too low or something. So I like to bring some kind of a card reader. You can get them that fit into your smartphone. And that way you can walk in front of your camera initially, see what the picture's like. Is it in the right location? And then, then you can leave. So it's well worth doing that. Make sure you got extra memory cards and, and pre-format them before you leave. Have those ready to go. Because if all you're doing and your batteries are fine, there's usually an indicator on the, on the camera that shows your battery life. And if you got plenty of battery life left, you may want to just switch out cards. So this way you can go in there, put a new card, take the old one out, and you're done and you're, you're gone. So um, you can be, it can be very quick as long as you've got your extra cards. Always want to have extra batteries. If you open it up and the batteries are uh, very low, then you want to replace them. If you're doing a baited site and, you can, and, and it is legal, if it is legal, some states you can't bait. So if it is permitted, then you might want to have extra bait to refresh that. Of course, you want some to carry it in. A backpack works real well. There may be other things you'll come up with. Uh, one of the things, you know, I mentioned the lens. You may want to bring something to clean that lens off because I can tell you spiders will build spider webs in them. Um, you'll get dust in there. And so sometimes it, you'll need to wipe that clean. So on your setup, the first thing you want to do if you purchase one, you finally decide the one you want, you need to read and reread all those instructions. They can be a little confusing if you're not as techy, but um, you need to understand how to do this. And once you feel comfortable with it, and that's have your camera right there, go through it, read the instruction with your camera, follow through, make sure you understand how this all works. And then after you feel like you understand it, set the camera the way you think you're gonna do it and go outside, set it on a tree or whatever, and start using it by walking back and forth or have your dog walk back and forth. Take some pictures at different distances um, to see how the images look. Do it at night, you know, see what's a, what it looks like at night, how clear are the pictures. Um, so th these are things you want to do. And this is what that trailcampro.com, that's what they do. They have a pretty elaborate setup. They'll have the distances marked in, in, in feet. Um, they'll walk in front of it. Then they actually have a a 3D deer that they set up at different distances and take these pictures, especially at night, because this is where, um, you know, the infrared has a little bit of trouble picking up at, at greater distances. So um, it's great to do this. This way you know what you got. And then when you're out there setting it up, you've got the groundwork for how you want to set it up because you know its limitations. So talk about their modes. And you can see in that picture, to the right there that the, um, it, it, this is how it shows up on there. So there, he's looking at the video length. If you're gonna take video, um, how, how many seconds do you wanna run? So remember the more, the more pictures you're taking and on, on more video you use, the more memory or storage it takes up and the more battery life. So uh, think about that when you're setting these up. So you wanna make sure you set the date and time, right? Because this allows you to know when this activity occurs. And that's very important. A lot of cameras allow you to do moon phases and temperatures, which this uh, basically you can set up a log if you want to do that. And when is this animal activity occur? What temperatures are they more active? Um, is the moon phase have an impact on activity? So these are things you can set up and you can look at your images and it shows the moon phase and temperatures. So how many pics, pictures do you want to take per trigger? So every time your passive infrared detector picks up at some detect something, how many pictures do you want to take? Sometimes you want to take one or two if it's on bait or a food source because the animal's going to stay there for a while. If you have it set on an, on four, five, six photographs, you're going to have this, you're going to have hundreds and maybe even thousands of picture, pictures because this deer stays there for 30 minutes. Every time it moves just a little bit, it's going to take two, three, four, five pictures. So generally, if it's on a bait, you only want it to have take one or two. If it's on a trail, you may want to have it say three, four, five, or something like that, because you want to get every chance to get the that deer, that animal plus what's behind it. Again, if you want to take video, remember um, they can only 30 second videos. A uh, 32 gigabyte card can only take 30 of those, so you may want to think about that. And my understanding is, if you have it set on video, you can't take stills, but may want to research that a little bit. I, I was just thinking of that. I'm not absolutely certain, but usually um, 
it's it's either still or video. And then you have a delay. You can set your delay depending again what you're going to do. You want to you want the delay to be longer if, if the animal is going to be standing there for a while, like it's on a, on bait or a food source. But you basically want to set it on zero if it's on tr on a trail because you want you don't want it to, to delay. You want it to take that second picture and third picture as quickly as possible. Talked a little bit about SD cards already, um, but I didn't know about the classes of SD cards. So basically the class determines on how quickly the image will be written to storage. So um, if you have a high definition cam uh, camera, you definitely want a class 10 is what they were saying. But you have to read your instructions because they said some cameras can't take the higher class SD cards. And, and that includes the uh, number of gigabytes and, and the uh, class itself. So read your instructions by based on what they recommend. And that goes the same with batteries. Uh, lithium ion, again, is probably the most recommend, rec recommend, recommended. Um, but, you know, they are also more expensive. And you see you have to buy eight at a time. You can go through quite a bit of money. Some cameras do allow solar panels, and these would be great. You have rechargeable batteries. Um, and these can be a great way to basically have unlimited use of, of, uh, of the batteries, as well as you can buy these um, battery packs. We have one for our cell phone. You can buy these for these on certain cameras that you can put a, a battery pack out there, which allows it to last significantly longer. So on camera placement, again, this on your research when you're doing your own testing, this will determine how far you want to have your camera away from where you expect this animal to be. So if you're monitoring a trail, you want to have it at the, a spot where it's not too close, where you get a blurred image or a real close image, but not too far where you can, can't pick out any detail. So generally, um, they say about 10 yards, you know, about 30 feet. A lot of the limits come with your nighttime photographs. The uh, distance may be up to 60 feet during the day and maybe only 40 feet or so at night. So um, you want to make sure you have it at a distance where um, you, you get the right image you want. Now, of course, these animals move and they'll come closer and they'll go farther away. So you can't you obviously can't control that. But um, you do it on the, the most common spot you expect to see an animal. Again, mentioned that there's actually a cable on that one, one there. If you're going to, if you're on a hunt club or public land, or if it's not land of your own, I highly recommend you lock these up because they are very, they're very easy to walk away. These cameras over the years have gotten much smaller and they are easy theft items. So make sure you put some kind of a lock on them. They've actually got uh, metal cases that these cameras fit in and then those get locked onto the tree so it makes it a little bit harder um, to, to get take away the, the cameras but these are high high theft items this is why your obstructions are in your way you can see that branch is in to, you can see that image that branch is really impacting any kind of a quality image so you want to make sure you have your clippers and your saws and to uh, clip all that away and this is where your test after you set your camera, the test is important to make sure none of that is there. It also can give you false triggers if the sun is hitting those. It gives it a false reading. You want to place your camera as much northerly as you can. This way you get the least amount of sun impact. You can see that image there. It has a it's just washed out by the sun rays coming hitting into the into the lens and the infrared. Um, so it, it is a, a false trigger possibly. There may have been something that moved it, but it may have been a false trigger. So you'll get a lot of pictures like this as the sun comes up or as the sun sets. So, you know, you got to think about both of those. And the height is generally, it depends on the, obviously the animal that you're wanting to take pictures of. In deer, it's generally about your waist height. So about three feet. And you want it about midpoint of the deer's uh, chest cavity or body. So that again depends on the animal you're taking you're taking pictures of. If you're getting taking smaller pic animal pictures, obviously you want to lower it down. One thing to keep in mind, and this happens sometimes, 
and this is why you want to do your test after you've placed your camera, if the ground slopes downward, you're going to have to adjust the angle of your camera. Or your, if you put it flat up against the tree and the land, land slopes downward, you're going to get a lot of head pictures and not, not the entire um, body of the, the animal. So a very simple fix on that is to get a stick of the right diameter. You tilt your camera down, you put the stick behind it, you tighten your straps, and that will allow your camera to be sloped downward. And then you're, you're set, doesn't cost anything else. You can also get tripods. You can buy tripods. You can buy these uh, little devices that screw into a tree. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that on game lands. They don't like things into trees, and, but it, it's removable. I mean, it's not something you leave in there. But it allows you to adjust the angle of that camera. Um, you don't need a tree in the area. You can set it up someplace where there's no trees or not the right tree. So that, this gets to be an issue sometimes. You find this perfect spot you want to set a camera, and there's no trees there that work. So these tripods can be very, very handy. So here's just a list of best practices. Um, Um, the one is avoid checking your camera too often. This is something that, you know, because avoidance, animal avoidance, you know, you're putting your scent, your activity out there. So you definitely want to try to avoid checking it too often. So that's where your batteries and your, your uh, storage helps a lot. Avoid peak deer movement or whatever animal you're trying to, trying to take photographs of. You don't want to go early in the morning, late in the evening. Think midday. This is when the least movement of the animals occurs. Rubber gloves and boots can reduce your scent and think scent control of all times. You may even want to cover scent. Approach your, your cameras with, that, with the least disruption to where you think these animals are bedding. Um, again, bring new batteries, SD cards. You want to swap these out quickly. You don't want to have to fumble around with it. And again, you may want to bring your SD card reader and do a quick um, scan of your photographs to make sure your camera's set right so that you don't have to come back out after you've taken your SD, SD card out, then you have to come back out because the camera's not right. So it's well worth taking a, a real, taking a, a quick moment to review the pictures that you've taken. Most hunters are using this as somewhat as a scouting tool, um, but it, again, like it says at the bottom bullet, it does not eliminate boots on the ground. You've got to be out there scouting. but Obviously, it takes one little area at a time, so you're not scouting your whole property. You're putting this in areas where you anticipate activity. So you can, by the date, date and time stamp, you can tell when they're moving, um, what animals are moving in the area. So this is, uh, you know, a great tool to find what's in that area that you maybe that may be where you're going to hunt. Uh, again. Don't forget daylight savings time. Um, if, when that happens, make sure you adjust that time. Deer travel patterns change throughout the year. So what was a hot spot for your camera at one time of the year, may, you may not get anything on it at other times. You know, their food sources change. So their, their travel patterns, you know, when the breeding season comes in, you'll see in a minute, um, their, their home range changes dramatically. So what, what you see, in April, May, June, July is not what you're necessarily going to see in uh, October, November. So this is the a home range of a deer that's had a collar on it, and this is up in on Chesapeake Farms. It's a buck, and so you can see the average home range of a deer is, is about a square mile, which is 640 acres. That's a pretty big chunk of land. So you know you have one or two cameras out. You know how how many times are you going to catch all these deer? Um, doe have a little bit smaller home range, but it still can be very extensive. It depends on their needs. Obviously, they need food, water, cover. And so the farther they have to range to get all those, the bigger their home range is going to be. But if you look at this, the blue, the light blue line, everything changes come the breeding season, the rut. Look at how much larger that is. It's huge. It's at least double the size of their core home range. So this is why a lot of times there's these overlaps. You'll get a, a picture of a deer you've never seen before. You might actually harvest a deer you've never seen on any of your cameras before, and this may be why. So um, you just gotta you gotta realize that these these deer change, especially come rut. 
There's another little phenomenon that deer do, and they're called excursions. Um, this is where a deer can walk maybe four, five, six miles out of its core range, may spend a couple of days someplace, and then come back. I don't think they understand exactly why they do this. It's not strictly for food. I mean, um, and it's not always during the breeding season. But this is, again, why you might harvest a deer you've never seen or you get one on a camera and they do this different times of the year. So these excursions are reasons you might get deer on your cameras that you don't normally see. So you want to place them on obvious spots where you're going to anticipate deer. So deer trails, if you can find a good deer trail. These, you can see these pictures over here, what I call funnels or, or some people call them pinch points or something. It's a travel corridor, something that focuses deer movement. And you can see on here, this dark green areas are wooded. And so deer don't like to be out in the fields, the lighter areas or fields. They much rather be in he heavy cover. So it's gonna focus this deer movement into this covered area versus out in these fields. And so this is not only a good place to put a camera, maybe a great place to put a stand as well. So obviously uh, deer food sources, you know, whether it's acorns or persimmons or plums, things that are out there dropping or available to them during different times of the year, great places to put cameras because this is going to bring deer to them. Of course, you can put up a bait station like a feeder and this will bring them to them as long as you've got bait going. And then mineral sites down here at the bottom, this is a, a, a salt lick. Um, they will come to it during the summer months. It's not very effective during the cool season. They don't use it nearly as much. If you can find buck scrapes, these are obviously during the get, get preparation for the breeding season. These can be great places to put um, a camera. So you can use them not just for, of course, you can view other wildlife. I mean, just when I'm sitting on my stand, I like to see not only deer, I like to see other things. So very common to see various things on your on your camera. You can see bear, a lot of wild turkeys in places. This this. You can see the Sasquatch down here at the bottom. Um, you'll see this Sasquatch here, this picture here. That's one of our mentors. And you'll get a lot of those because you're when you're going to take down your camera, you, you'll usually look into it to, to when you go to take it off the tree and you'll get a picture of yourself. In there. So I mentioned these deer surveys. If you go to deerassociation.com or if you get that uh, deer camera book, they detail how to do a camera survey. And this, like I said, it's not for most new hunters. It's not for somebody who's hunting game land. You wouldn't want to do it on that. Uh, but somebody that has a hunt club or their own land, this can be very interesting. You, you can just do it a complete evaluation of your deer herd, a population number of bucks, that your different deer, your ratios, your buck to doe ratios, different things like that. So these are set up by one camera per 100 acres and they're on baited sites and you have to pre-bait. So you pay bait for two weeks in advance, that's getting the deer coming to the site. And then you run this for uh, up either 10 or 14 days. There's ways to calculate all the parameters, whether you do it 10 or 14 days. It has to be a time when there's antlers on bucks because the way you differentiate these is by the antlers. So you really have to study these images and you have to look at the antlers and you have to differentiate and you categorize each different buck. And that's kind of the basis for all the calculations that you do. Very hard to differentiate does. If you've seen enough of them, there are a few you can tell the difference, but most of them look very, very, very similar. So once you get all your images, then you're gonna go ahead and analyze and count the deer and that's how you do your calculations. Very important not to do this during prime acorn drop because the deer don't necessarily come to bait and your common bait that you use for these is whole kernel corn. So uh, you don't want to do this during the prime acorn drop. So just a fun thing to do. Like I said, we did it with at Harris Lake Park, learned a lot and, and enjoyed it too. Surveillance, you'll find that if you set up a camera, you'll probably end up getting a picture of somebody. Um, could be somebody you know, could be a dog, could be trespassers could be four wheelers, so you just never know. This image down here in the bottom right, this is actually a deputy sheriff that was on our property in New Hill. We had an incident on a, in a house behind our property and he was out looking for a uh, the perpetrator of that incident, so he we caught him on camera. 
So you can find out what's really out there. I've got just some pictures. These are mainly came from our cameras. Um, you'll set out your bait station like this is a feeder up up here. You know, you're, it flings out food or bait of some sort. And you're going, oh, look at all my my all my bait's gone. My food is gone. I got a lot of deer here. But then you'll find out there's a lot more out there eating it than, than deer. So you can see these raccoons, they get very, uh, very wise to what's going on. And they'll actually get up here and just sh and they'll just shake out the the corn out of your feeder. So they get very smart. Squirrels are another one. They'll be down there and they're there all day long. What they can't eat, they're out there burying. So they'll take up a lot of your corn. Turkeys will come in, sometimes flocks of five, 10, even 20 birds, and boy, will they eat a lot. But this very interesting picture right there at the camera, spreading its wings. This is a fox. Uh, they don't eat much bait, but they uh, it's fun to have pictures of them. It's also a raccoon back there. Crows will find your, if you're throwing out food, they'll find it pretty easily and they'll be there pretty often. This is a pretty good image. This was a, a, a camera site that was wide open, no bait, whatever reason, this, <laughs> this doe came right up to the, to the camera. So that was pretty interesting. This is a bobcat we happened to get on one. This is a flying squirrel, and this was actually not one of our cameras, but I happened to see this. I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. So you just never know what you're going to get. This is also obviously a white flash. You can see color. This is on one of our cameras. This is a pileated woodpecker. And if you look back here in the back, this feeder here was mine. These white tubes are actually PVC, and I went online and figured out if you attach this PVC to the legs of your feeder, and then grease it with Vaseline, the raccoons won't climb up there and get it. They almost destroyed the spinner and everything on my feeder by chewing on it. This is a coyote. You'll probably get lots of coyotes in you, where you don't even think they are, even in, in neighborhoods. These things are, are very adaptable, um, very uh, versatile in what they'll feed on. So you'll get these things pretty commonly. I just thought this was an interesting picture. Uh, it was a some, something startled this doe and got it in mid-flight there. It's one of our cameras. This is the same one, same place that that doe was right looking right into the camera. So just to mention this, uh, this is a, a fun place to go and visit and look at some of the images that they picked, they caught around the state. This is the candid critter. I keep wanting to say candid camera, but this is an NC State candid critter. Um, it was a program where they just wanted the an average citizen to go put out cameras all over the state, and you could you could volunteer to do this. Maybe some of you did it. Um, I wanted to do it, and my cameras weren't didn't meet their qualifications as far as uh, trigger speed. But this is a great thing. Here were, were some of their qualifications. My my trigger speed was just under a second, but not under a half a second. So they didn't want mine. That they were going to they did loan cameras if you wanted to go in and pick them up but I didn't do that. So you can use whatever flash. So it's got just got various things that you need to have to in order to do this. So here's some of the pictures they took. This is a feral hog. Areas are some areas in North Carolina have a lot of feral hogs, so you might get a lot of those pictures. Some of the deer pictures, there's one going to the bathroom. Um, this one on the upper right, that's generally not a good sign on your habitat if the deer are having to reach up that high to get food. That means there's not much food down on the ground, so you may want to do some work on your habitat. Um, then on the one on the bottom is just a, a buck, little buck that was kind of like that doe came right up to the camera. It's kind of a neat picture of a rabbit just posing for the for the camera. You probably get a lot of foxes on the left and then the coyotes again on the right. It's a good picture of those coyotes. Turkeys come pretty frequently. The ones upper left is our young poults. And then the bottom picture is a, a gobbler in full strut. That's kind of interesting. Some areas of quite a few bear, especially along the coast. So I'm sure you got they got plenty of bear, bear pictures. So that's all I had on the trail cameras. I did want to bring this up just to remind people of what's going on. Um, these are the future webinars we have in, in June, July, and August. Some great ones coming up. Also in September, we have two seminars. Um, we are teaching these as well. These are through the Resource Commission skill base. 
webinars. Um, deer Hunting 101 is kind of the introduction to deer hunting, kind of goes through the whole thing from deer biology all the way to deer processing, but very lightly into deer processing because we have another one where it is practical deer processing, and that goes from uh, field dressing all the way to um, butchering. And then on November and November 13th is the way it's scheduled right now, is we're going to do a, a, a hands-on, <coughs> excuse me, deer processing. There's going to be multiple sites. We know there's going to be one down at us where my wife and I live in Lillington. Um, we're a deer donation site for Hunters for the Hungry, so we have quite a few deer come in. So we usually have plenty to, to work on. And then we last year had one in near Apex in uh, Chatham County, and then we had one up in Chapel Hill. So we invited our, our students, our um, New Hill students to come as well as general public. So uh, it's, it's a great way to do it. We actually have deer there. You get to help clean these deer um, and process some of them, and then in some cases, get to take some of the meat home. So it, it's a great, great thing to do and hope to see people there. All right, that's all I have. Liz, it's uh, open to you for if there's any questions. All right, great presentation, Guy, thank you. Um, I'll start out real quickly before I forget, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation does have a photo contest, and this is the first year that there's a category for trail cameras. So if you guys have any great trail camera pictures, go to the website, check out the photo contest if you'd like to enter them. And uh, with that, we'll start taking any questions that anyone has. I don't see anything in the chat box yet, but if you do have a question, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. I must have done a great job. You covered everything, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so great, so great. <laughs> so we'll give folks just another minute if anybody's got any questions. And as we mentioned too, um, Guy is one of the mentors and everything. So if you have a question that's not directly related to cameras, I'm sure he'll still he'll still take it. So uh, yeah. We do have one comment that says great presentation guy and uh, I completely <laughs> agree. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, so if we don't have any questions this evening because our speaker was so thorough, I will give a special thanks to the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program and all the facilitating partners. Uh, watch for a post webinar email with a link for all materials related to this evening's webinar and a registration link for our next webinar in the series, which is June 22nd. The webinar will be getting to know whitetail deer and shot placement. Our speaker will be Killian Nowre from the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program. And uh, Guy just showed you a list of upcoming events, so you guys have all of that. And if you have further questions or would like more information on outdoor opportunities, please contact the New Hill Education and Mentoring Program at the link or Facebook page provided. Also check out NC to learn more about the Wildlife Federation and join a local chapter to do wildlife conservation projects. So thank you so much for this evening's presentation, Guy, and thanks to all of you who could join us.